right, so I guess I'm ready to, to go. Um, my name is Christian Fager. I'm a professor at the Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. Uh, this is, I'm going to talk a little bit about our work on analysis of massive MIME one phase array transmitter impairments. And uh, this has been done in collaboration with National Instruments, of course, but also a, a number of other companies in our Gigert Center. And you see some of these companies listed uh, here. So um, before doing that, I thought I could say some words about the areas w that we collaborate with National Instruments on. And um, uh, I can start to the top left. We do actually have a very nice contribution work on, on a fixed setup. Uh, if you go to that web page, you can actually do a measurement right now, remotely from here. So it will be connected to our measurement equipment and you can look at the data in real time. And, and that's interesting for people. And you can see that uh, it has been used all over the world. Uh, another area that we uh, work on is real-time DPD. We do work on massive MIMO at millimeter waves. Uh, and uh, lots of works on active load pool. Uh, but that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about system simulations. So um, an outline of this uh, speak is first I'll give a motivation for the work. Uh, I'll talk a little, about, a little bit about the simulation framework that we have developed for multi-antenna systems. Then I will divide my presentation in two parts. Uh, one part where I focus on phased arrays. And actually this will be the main part of my, my presentation. But I also wanted to say something about how the same framework can also be used in, uh, in MIMO uh, applications and also including thermal effects, which is uh, very relevant. So of course the, the background and the motivation to this work is that traditionally uh, multi-antenna systems have been designed in a very modular way. You know, we have, a, we have a signal processing guys uh, they don't uh, easily communicate with the circuit guys, uh, and these guys don't easily communicate with antenna guys. So they, but fortunately, we have this 50 ohm interface in between that allows us to work quite independently, at least in the past. But um, uh, and if not, you can of course put nice later in between. But of course, this is not uh, the way to go for 5G and more commercial high volume applications, we need a much more integrated solution, in particular if we go up in frequency. So uh, we foresee something that is uh, much more integrated, as I said, uh, both on the circuit level, but also in like the package level, where there are uh, one important difference is, of course, the size, but also the interfaces become less well defined, I think. Uh, you can face lots of uh, challenges in such an environment. This is, of course, uh, better from a cost point of view, and it also allows us much more tighter integration of digital and, and uh, analog electronics. Some of the challenges that comes with that is, uh, of course, both to deal with the signals. How do we design the signals to meet the desired system requirements? Uh, in particular, if you have large numbers of signals, both the signal design itself, but also the shuffling of, of signals and data in such systems is a big challenge. Uh, there are also lots of uh, new interactions between circuits and antennas. Uh, we probably don't have needed space nor uh, want to pay for the cost of uh, putting isolators in between here. So we can expect to have much, more, uh, le much less ideal interfaces between the circuits and antennas. And that also brings us to challenges on characterization and analysis and design. Uh, how do we connect an instrument to, uh, to such a system? That's not uh, very easy uh, by itself. And it also, there's lots of challenges on power dissipation and the thermal effects, how that is going to be treated in such an integrated solution, and overall complexity. So uh, in my presentation, I'll touch a little bit about uh, those three bullets. But uh, the way we do it is that we first set up a simulation framework, and I'm talking now about a system, RF system level simulation framework. And it's um, uh, an introduction here to that is that if we traditionally have this 50 ohm interface, uh, then we used to 
also work with behavior models uh, that are made for the, such an environment where you can assume that the load impedance is fixed. Uh, this also means that it's enough with a single input, single output representation. The output voltage or the output wave, if you want, is a function of the input signal only. Uh, and that was in general. Of course, you could have harmonics, as the previous speaker talked about here, but uh, still it's an input to output relationship. Uh, what we have well, uh, looked upon here is uh, the situation when things become more integrated. And um, in that case, we do no longer assume that the load is perfectly 50 ohm, but we can accept that the circuits also face an incident wave caused by the reflections as, uh, as of mismatch, but also, for example, due to crosstalk between the different transmitters in, in the in this uh, circuit. So uh, that's the background. And um, of course, we all know that if we change the impedance, uh, things happen. Uh, I just put this slide here uh, to illustrate, of course, that in a power amplifier, it's obvious. We, we all know load pool. And obviously, if you change the impedance, the output power efficiency and linearity and everything changes. So it is expected to have some effect if it is not perfectly 50 ohm. Uh, okay, so that brings me to the next topic, and that's the behavioral modeling. And this, I think it connect, connects very nicely to the, again to the previous speaker, who talked about uh, circuit-level modeling on one hand and behavioral modeling on the other hand. Uh, and um, that's the way we see it also. This is a model that is suitable for system simulations. It is, uh, has this form. I make the output wave. I talk about waves here in my model. So the output wave is a function, on a linear function of the input wave and a possible incident wave also at the output, an A2 wave coming to the output of the amplifier. Or I, I, I actually I should not say amplifier because this could be any uh, device in the complex baseband domain. Uh, what we also assume, at least for this model, is that the mismatch is relatively small. We're operating not too far away from 50 ohm. And that makes some simplifications uh, in the model derivation, which, which is not in principle necessary, but it makes the model a bit si simpler. OK, what do you then end up with if you make a Taylor expansion? For the static terms, you end up with uh, this kind of arrangements. And if you look at the terms, this is also the PhD model that falls out. Uh, you see you have a number of uh, conjugate and non-conjugate terms, and uh, you select the ones that give output at the fundamental frequency. So this is a model that looks at the fundamental output uh, frequency only, not the harmonics. Uh, the drawback, as was also mentioned before, is that this, the PhD model is typically quasi-static, so you don't have any uh, dependence on history uh, here. So uh, what we then did was that we applied our knowledge from DPD models. So if you look down here, for example, this is uh, what would DPD people would be calling a, P, um, sorry, a memory polynomial. You see, the, it is a function of the, the A1 raised to power, but also with some memory terms, delayed uh, M1. So that would be an ordinary memory polynomial, but this would be for S21, and you can make the same for S22 and this T22 term that you have. So this brings, uh, actually it's a generalization of the PhD model, uh, you can say, with memory. And uh, it's in time, envelope time domain and uh, suitable for system level simulations. So uh, the way to identify this model is to, uh, of course, you need to excite this circuit with um, a signal that is representative of what will happen in the application. And um, uh, this means that we need to expose our circuit with uh, a modulated signal at the input, a wideband signal, but also uh, inject another wideband signal to the output. Uh, preferably, or uh, these signals that you inject should be ind independent of each other to excite all the different mixing products that, that may happen. Uh, so you can say if you would be a load pool simply, then uh, you would simply make the same signal to the input and output. But here it's important that they're different. And, and this is not difficult to do in the simulator. It's just to set up a multi-tone, multi for example, simulation here in, in VSS, or actually in... Uh, in micro office, but you can of course also do it in measurements, for example, in, a, in an active load pool setup, injecting two different signals. 
what is also important here if you compare uh, traditional behavior modeling is that the reference planes now become important. I mean, normally in DPD we don't care about uh, the reference plane, but now since we talk about incident waves, we need to know and we need to make a calibration at a specific reference plane. And that's uh, automatically what you get in, for example, in an active low pool setup, so that's nothing strange. If we take these models then and put them together uh, to make a multi-antenna transmitter, for example, uh, each of these green boxes would then be a uh, power amplifier. Well, maybe I should click here, by the way. We should probably start from the left. Okay, of course, to the left here, you have some signal processing that uh, if it's a MIMO application, you have multiple data streams that are, and this would be called a precoder. Uh, that is how you generate the signals to each uh, amplifier or each antenna branch. If it's beamforming, you have only one input signal, and this is the beamforming vector uh, corresponding to phase delays. Uh, anyway, so, so you have a signal processing part, uh, but then you have these behavioral models that I talked about, the models that can handle mismatch, and one would be here for every uh, circuit, or every power amplifier, and you see that uh, they produce output waves that go towards the antenna, but they also have incident waves. Uh, the antenna here will be represented by, for example, S parameters, because the S parameters are uh, perfectly suited for this, because the S parameters relate by definition how these waves back and forth uh, relate to each other. And it can be an antenna, but of course, in the general sense, this could be the S parameters of the entire interconnect, interconnect that you have, the entire network with uh, everything. And once you actually, it is possible to solve the joint uh, operation of all those uh, amplifiers with the antenna. And what it will give you is the output, amplitude and phase, or output modulated signals in each branch. And that uh, uh, tells us what will be radiated from the antenna elements. And by superposition, we can then get the far field, for example. So uh, that brings me to the phased arrays. So uh, now we use that framework to do some simulations of a phased array. And uh, as an example, I have here a uh, phased array uh, or 64 element antenna array for 28 gigahertz. Uh, and I've only needed the S parameters. I don't have the radiation patterns. I have not included it, but it's in principle, you could also do that if you want. Uh, and I study a phased array scenario, as I said, which means that the B, now the signal processing here is only doing phase delays. I should have included phase delays, but essentially it's the input signal phase delayed. And um, of course, when you solve this, you could directly relate the forward and backward waves in each uh, branch, and that is the load impedance, the active impedance seen into the uh, antenna. And uh, it is well known for people in... Um, at least working with the antenna arrays, that the impedance will change as you scan. And uh, in this example, uh, you can see, for example, what happens if you scan the elevation from 0 to 90 degrees. So that's each of those curves is such a scan, and uh, each trace is for different uh, azimuth. And you can see that there is a substantial change of the load impedance happening due to the scan impedance. And I think it's uh, in principle, unavoidable in an antenna design that you have this effect. At least in, if you want to make it uh, with small separation or lambda half separation, for example. Uh, so now, now we want to see, of course, what effect does that have on the circuit and uh, the transmitter. And for that, we need to have these models. So I have uh, actually a 28 gigahertz power amplifier design, but I was not allowed to show the details of that design. Uh, by one of the companies, but in principle you put it into a VSS and you, or a, a micro office, you say, and you get the waves, and you use the waves and extract the polynomial coefficients in the model that I showed before. Uh, and then you can compute it and compare uh, and look at the agreement. Uh, maybe this is not the perfect agreement, I would not say, but uh, anyway, it's, uh, the two traces overlap quite nicely, the model and measured spectrum in, in this case. So um, the phased array configuration that we have is now that we have these models and we have this antenna and we connect them together and we feed, uh, in this case, it happened to be a narrowband signal, it doesn't really matter, but uh, in this case, just for an example, a 
5 megahertz signal. Uh, I also assume that each PA is linearized in 50 ohm. So I, I'm not interested now in the nonlinear effects by the, each branch by itself. I'm interested in the added nonlinear effects of the phased array. Uh, I do ideal phased uh, array beam steering without any tapering, just uh, for example. And uh, in cases I show far fields, it is assuming isotropic radiation patterns, but uh, that of course could have just be changed by the real patterns if I had them. So for example, what the simulation tells us is, uh, uh, for example, the output power or the radiated power versus uh, scan angle. So here we scan to all of those different uh, positions. We scan in theta and phi. Uh, so imagine that this is the beam sweeping around. And uh, we see that the output power is different in different uh, directions as caused by the modulation of the load impedance. And uh, in this example, the variation of the power is around 2 dB. And that could, of course, depend a lot on, on the power amplifier specifics and the antenna design. You could also see that the far field distortion, uh, the distortion that the user sees in a specific direction, uh, depends on where that uh, user is located. Uh, if you look at the out of band, maybe that's least interesting, but uh, let's say the in band distortion that the user uh, signal has, it also depends a lot on where, in which position that user is located. You see that there is a difference in, in uh, NMSE from uh, around 26 to 36, roughly. So there's a significant change of the distortion depending on where you are. And that's also what you see in the spectrum. This is in the best direction, direction you have the blue curve spectrum, and in the worst direction you have the red curve. So um, I will now look a little bit more closer into, into those. Uh, directions. So that's the basically one. Uh, the one, this would be the the worst direction is 70 degrees theta and the zero phi, and the best direction would be uh, 240 degrees phi and uh, 70 or 60 degrees theta. Uh, what is nice now is that uh, for each scan position, we can look into each branch of the array transmitter and investigate uh, how does the each PA behave uh, individually. So all these lines correspond, well, each line corresponds to a specific power amplifier in, in the array. And you see that each array, each power amplifier has a different AM, AM characteristic, because this is the AM AM. And for, for the good, for the low distortion case, you see that uh, this is the, there's some spread. Some uh, PA is compressed and some expand. Of course, the, that depends on, on uh, how the load impedance uh, changes. And another way to see it is a control plot where you have the 64 antenna elements. And this is a color representing the amount of compression that, uh, that you have. So uh, in this case, there is around uh, 1.2 dB compression. And that's for AMAM. And this is for AM, PM. And again, you can see that some, some go down in phase and some go up in phase. Uh, it's interesting now to compare to uh, the worst direction. There you have uh, this situation. And actually, it, it turns out that in, in this direction, uh, 70 degrees theta and phi zero, they all align. The distortion of, of all branches align in a way that they have expanding nonlinearities. Uh, so this means that actually the, the uh, PA is expanding around 1.8 dB, I think. All PAs expand around 1.8 dB in that direction, in, in that scanning direction. And you see that it is quite uniformly across the array. Uh, and it's the same for the, for the phase. Just, um, so, so this explains why I think that what happens here is that in this direction, there is, uh, they all align in a bad way. And in the good direction, they all kind of align in a, in a way that they cancel, the, the problems cancel each other. So in average, you have an, a relatively linear uh, average PA. Just for reference, I also made a case where I switched off the mutual coupling in the antenna array. Then you end up in this situation. So in this case, there is no, uh, no dependence on the scan angle. But there is still some expand. Remember that I linearized it to 50 ohm. 
so I would not expect to see any distortion. But in fact, the distortion that you see is from the fact that the antenna elements are not perfectly matched to 50 ohm. The, I mean, I said that the amplifier was linearized in 50 ohm, but the, of course the elements are not perfect and they are not perfectly matched to 50 ohm. So this means that uh, they will have a slightly different compression characteristic as compared to a 50 ohm case. Um, so um, another way to look at it is uh, in terms of the side lobes. I don't know how to illustrate that in a good way, but here is one illustration. Uh, what you see here, for example, in the top left is the channel power. That's the power in the direct, uh, desired channel. When I have uh, uh, put the scan angle to 30 degrees in elevation and azimuth, you see it is concentrated, the power in a specific direction. But of course, due to the side lobes, you have power coming a little bit in other directions as well. This is in-channel power. Of course, if you look then at the adjacent channel, maybe uh, it is not so interesting to have the adjacent channel here, but it, certainly there are other positions where you also have a lot of adjacent uh, power coming. And um, you can, for example, compare if you switch on and off the mutual coupling and see how that is influencing the distortion levels and side load levels, etc. And um, uh, this is just another example for a different scan position. You see now, if I scan to this uh, direction, you get a different behavior. But uh, this is the purpose here is mainly to show the capabilities of this simulation framework. <laughs> so um, this was about phased arrays. Uh, the same approach can be completely equally well be used in a MIMO configuration. And when I say MIMO, I mean that uh, in principle, that you have uh, more or less independent signals coming to each antenna element, uh, and the signals are generated, for example, in a, by a precoder that is determined by the channel uh, characteristics. And of course, if you have a free space channel, then the beamforming would come out of it. But uh, free, sp uh, free space and one user, then the, it would be the same. But this is for the general case. And. Um, we, I will start by showing some measurement results that we had, or some, uh, an experimental investigation that we did. This was reported at IMS uh, two years ago. Uh, we then took two power amplifiers. We made, uh, it's a GAN uh, test board from Cree. Uh, they were uh, characterized and modeled according to what I described before. Uh, I then manufactured uh, uh, three different antenna arrays you see, and they had different separations just to, to emulate different uh, coupling. And we wanted to investigate what influence does the coupling have on the uh, distortion in a MIMO configuration. Uh, so MIMO here means that the input signals to those two are modulated signals, but they are orthogonal or independent, two independent modulated signals. So it's not, it's not a beam forming in that sense. Okay, so the, the um, theory then uh, if I put this in these models for the power amplifiers and the antenna S parameters into the simulation, uh, you get the following picture where each line corresponds to a different antenna design. So the, clearly the S parameters here uh, of the antennas change, but the rest is, is not changed. And you see that the, due to the mixing that happens when signals from one power amplifier leaks into the other one, I mean, then basically it's a mixing. Uh, that creates nonlinear distortion that you see as the spectral regrowth in that uh, simulation. And that spectral regrowth depends then on how closely you space the antennas. And that's what the simulation predicts. The lower curve, by the way, is without any coupling at all. Uh, so that's the lowest level that we, the linearity basically of, of our system. In the measurements, the situation uh, looked uh, quite similar. Of course, there is a noise floor that prevents us to see what happens at, at the lowest levels, but you clearly can see that there is a significant influence of the, of the coupling on the side lobe levels also there. So, um, so basically this shows that, uh, that we can predict things in this simulation approach that also uh, we can see in measurements. Uh, this was a simulation setup or measurement setup with two amplifiers we would be very happy to build 
large arrays also, but that of course is very complicated. Uh, so uh, anyway, I think this just made us confident that this, what we did, could be also uh, valid for larger arrays. So we made some simulation studies to see uh, what effects we could see. So for example, we made, using the same amplifiers, we would imagine now in a simulator uh, an 8x8 array. Uh, looks like this, so I have 0.44 lambda separation and you would have microstrip patches tuned to the center frequency. And uh, in this MIMO example, I have two users, and I used a so-called matched filter precoder uh, for the uh, signal design. Uh, if you look at the radiation pattern, it will uh, look like this. So we have clearly, uh, you clearly can see where the users are located. I should say here that this is for line of sight, so that's why we have clear beams. Uh, and if you look at the spectrum, I think this is the spectrum for user one. Uh, this is just the power. If you look in of the spectrum, it looks like that. Uh, if you don't have any effects of the hardware, but if you enable the mismatch and mutual coupling, you basically see the same thing as we saw for the for the measurement case. So I think uh, with this, I think it makes it quite easy to see what happens, what is the influence of antenna design, PA design, precoders, and different signal designs before building, uh, because I think. To build such a big 64 element array, I think one has to think very carefully before starting that exercise. The final uh, topic uh, that I want to just to say some short words about is the possibility that we have also uh, shown, hopefully here, the possibility to also add thermal effects into this uh, framework. Thermal effects are, of course, very important when we want to make antenna arrays, which are needed to be closely spaced because of the side lobe requirements and so forth. But then it also means that lots of heat is dissipated in a small area. So uh, actually, uh, we presented uh, last year a conference paper where we showed that if you make these power amplifiers models, not only dependent on the incident and reflected waves or uh, incident waves input and output, but also the temperature. Uh, then we get the temperature dependence of the gain into it. Uh, we also make another model for the dissipated power, because if we know the input signal, we also know uh, through the efficiency how much power is dissipated. Uh, so with, with the dissipated power and knowledge about the thermal coupling between the different uh, elements, different amplifiers, for example, uh, that the thermal coupling will tell us what will be the temperature. So the dissipated power gives a temperature, and the temperature is affecting the power amplifiers, essentially. And that can be solved jointly, or actually not jointly, because we here assume that, um, that the time response of the thermal network is slower than the molation speed, so we don't need to solve it jointly. We can use the, the temperature that we calculated one one symbol sample before is probably uh, quite similar to, I mean, it's not in megahertz time span, it's more in kilohertz probably, or seconds. Anyway, uh, it is possible to solve this and uh, find out interesting information. Uh, so we just made a simulation example again, uh, which includes a very simplified thermal model. This is not uh, at all accurate, but just a, a simplistic model, how an antenna array thermal coupling could look, with thermal coupling between the power amplifiers and also a thermal coupling to the base plate and a frame at a fixed temperature. We have a 2.14 gigahertz power amplifier design. And we extracted a model in the simulator. We have the same antenna array. And uh, from the PA design, we also have the efficiency and therefore the dissipated power uh, model. What you then see is that if you run the simulation, you can monitor the temperature rise versus time, for example. Uh, each trace here would correspond to an individual power amplifier in the, in the array. And you see that obviously they start from room temperature and they rise and settle at the different temperatures co uh, corresponding to the, the position in the array. Uh, and you see this small ripple that you have that's due to the modulation of the signal. Uh, anyhow, so uh, for example, this can give us a contour plot of the steady, tape, steady state temperature distribution. It could also give us the change. I mean, obviously, if you get 
different temperatures, the power that the steady state power that each power amplifier will produce will also change. And that is kind of skewing up the beamforming for us. So uh, all of those effects will be uh, accounted for. And uh, if I combine this with the mutual coupling, I can uh, see here, for example, a zero forcing case. Uh, in fact, you, don't, you will not notice a lot of difference in the radiation patterns. But here is no coupling and no thermal, thermal effects. Thermal effects, no coupling, uh, I mean no antenna coupling, and thermal effects and uh, antenna coupling. And actually the beamforming seems in this case not to change very much, but the spectrum and the NMS is uh, changing significantly, and one can distinguish what comes from each. So just uh, finally, this is another way to see it. We can study, for example, how the, the error of the in-band signal at user 1 changes versus time, and it's clear that as temperature rises, there will be some distortion uh, or there will be error. Of course, this means that the channel, in that case, will age, and we have to reiterate uh, the channel estimate corresponding to the time, uh, causing also non-reciprocity problems and so forth. But um, that's just uh, some preliminary results, and uh, we work further on experimental radiation verification of this, of course. So to wrap up, I think that the higher integration that we see in emerging, in emerging multi-antenna systems uh, leads to uh, the need for a much close, closer co-design of antennas and circuits. Uh, we've proposed a new multi-antenna RF uh, system analysis framework. And we, I should say that we work also with uh, NI on, on that. Uh, it allows us to study the interaction between signal circuits and antennas. And we particularly investigated phased array and MIMO transmitter scenarios. For example, active load modulation and how that affects linearity, but also antenna and the thermal coupling in, in MIMO transmitters. And I think that the accurate RF system simulations is really a key and very important now to speed up the development of future systems. So thank you very much for your attention.